Hello, I'm Mokar Rizvi, and this is Scope for the first segment of today's show. We're going to discuss um, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's visit to Israel to meet Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, as well as Benny Gantz, his coalition partner. Uh, this is in order to discuss, of course, annexation of the occupied West Bank, as well as Iran and Israel's concerns in that regard also. Um, all of this, of course, coming on the heels of the Trump peace plan, as understood by the Israelis. Uh, it's important to note, of course, that during this trip of Pompeo, he did not meet Palestinian leaders at all. And that seems to now be the norm, that the Palestinian leaders are not being brought into the fore to discuss something that would largely really affect them and their people. Um, there's talk, of course, about how annexation of the West Bank would violate the Fourth Geneva Convention. But on the part of Israel, at least now, there doesn't seem to be the need to really defend uh, this sort of move if it does occur, which it seems like it will uh, just in the coming days. Um, let's discuss that all a bit further. I'm joined by Yossi Mecklenburg, who is a professor of international relations at Regents University, and he's a senior consulting research fellow at Chatham House. He is joining us now from London. Joining us from Jerusalem is Alan Diaby, who is a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute. He's writing a book on the history of media in Israel and Palestine. Alan and Yossi, thank you both for your time today. Uh, Alan, let me start with you. What do you make of Pompeo's visit? Um, what does this indicate vis-a-vis -vis the annexation of the West Bank? He has... Um, as sort of fine print told Israeli leaders seemingly to ensure that they take into account all the factors uh, when it comes to how the ramifications of this would play out. Yes, thank you for having me today. First of all, the secretary uh, spent very little time, so far as we can tell, in Israel. He was here for all of six hours. And during that time, uh, again, from all the reports we've been getting, they spent a lot of their time talking about China and Iran. So the background always involves the Palestinians, of course, but it doesn't seem as if that was the primary factor. The uh, U.S. administration has been really hard on China recently and is attempting to ramp up pressure. And so that actually seemed to be the focus. Although, as you note, the uh, possible annexation of uh, communities in the West Bank is, is underlying this whole thing. There was no statements about that by either the secretary or the uh, Israeli leadership. And yes, he certainly didn't meet with Palestinians. He was in Israel for all of six hours. Hmm. All right, and what do you think of uh, overall then, Alan, the, the, the possibility that uh, the West Bank will be annexed? That is a possibility. It's certainly something that has been made a political a platform point of uh, Netanyahu, even in his coalition agreement with uh, Benjamin Gantz. However, for all of the talk, the government uh, that has been just constituted here in Israel is spending 90 plus percent of its time on defeating the coronavirus and its impact on the country. And while, in fact, the uh, only th other thing that this government has said it would do in the next six months is work on an annexation, I, I don't really see this happening anytime soon. Hmm. That's interesting. Yossi, do you agree with that? Do you think this is just a lot of talk uh, on the part of Gantz and Netanyahu and that it's not actually going to happen? I think that, Alan, I agree with Alan. It's more likely to be a lot of talk about it. And I think one important development that happened in the last 48 hours is the decision by the Yemina, the, the extreme right wing party, not to join the government, which means there won't be pressure from within the government, it will be more from outside the government, of a, of, of a party that represents the settlers. So I think this will ease a bit of the pressure on Netanyahu of, of actually a, a executing that. But I think it's dangerous enough that this has become part of the narrative, part of the discourse. And when, when uh, Mr. Pompeo talked about annexation as, as a domestic decision, as something for Israel to consider as if the Palestinians don't exist, they are not part of it, and in the same breath is also mentioning vision of peace, I think first we should not refer to this uh, as, a, as, a, as a peace plan or as a vision of peace, because there is no peace done only with one side in, 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 in a conflict. You need a Palestinian on, on, on board. But I think that, you know, I agree with Fallon, I think most of the of the efforts will be 
directed towards deal with the uh, aftermath of the coronavirus and, 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 and Iran, which is a major issue considering uh, the, the, the end of the embargo, the arms embargo. And the Palestinian issue will plow along, but not probably not very successfully, not much hope for a peaceful resolution. So, Yossi, I'm trying to understand, though. Uh, it seems that Israel has been given um, something on a, on a silver plate, right, when it comes to the annexation of the West Bank vis-a-vis -vis this vision of peace, this Middle East peace plan, however we want to term it, that, that Donald Trump presented and that Israel has signed on to. Why not just go ahead and do this, Yossi, at this point? I mean, what's holding the Israelis back? Those are implications. If you talk, the politician do all the talk, and it sounds good. Hey, eh? we have a permission from Washington to do something, which, which is probably the right wing uh, dream to have. But when do you look, you talk to the more operative level, operational levels, the security people, the business community, and other. There, there are implications for that. And uh, what it's going to be, is, are the Palestinians just going to accept it or actually it's going to uh, initiate a third intifada or to increase in, 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 in violence? What hope would the Palestinians have if there is an accession of at least 30 percent of the, of the West Bank without uh, negotiations? So they know that there are implications. Uh, we know that uh, in uh, the Friday's meetings of the mini foreign ministers of the EU, this is going to be in the midst of the, the worst pandemic in, in Europe for a century. This is going to be top, top on the agenda. What to do with that? So Netanyahu and Gantz are aware of it. So talk, talk aside. Uh, I think actually it would be more the Trump administration pushing it, the more it seems that the Trump administration is unable to cope with the pandemic in the United States. In order to pander to the evangelists and the Christian Zionists, mm -hmm. it will be seen as a vote winner in, in the United States more than it serves Israeli interests. Um, Yossi, I wonder, you know, when we're talking about the Middle East peace finance, you've already alluded to this, of course, the fact that the Palestinians have not been brought into this at all. Uh, how long can this really be kept up? I mean, it seems that we're just, of course, like like you said as well, just ignoring a very major party. I mean, it, it is genuinely the party that will be most affected by all of this. Um, and yet the, the U.S. administration, as well as the Israeli establishment, seems to think it's okay to just uh, ignore them. I mean, do you think that there are voices within Israel, even within this right-wing government, as some have understood it, who are probably telling them this is not a good idea? The security forces, as, as it happens in Israel, tell the, the politicians uh, it's not a good idea, let alone, uh, despite Netanyahu's image and all the bravado, he's a very cautious politician. He doesn't take too many bold decisions. He talks about bold decisions, but he doesn't take them. Uh, Gantz is probably even more hesitant in, in, in his decision. We haven't seen anything that in, but mm -hmm. hesitation from, 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 from Gantz. Under these circumstances, and mm -hmm. without the Yemeni party, the Naftali Bennett and Ayala Chaked of this world in, in, in government, I don't think even to see the push within the coalition. Here and there you will hear that, but it will remain on on a rhetorical level. Uh, again, we might be surprised, but I, I, I tend to think that it's not going to happen. And actually, the push for this will come more from Washington, uh, considering how Trump is, is, is faring in public opinion polls, and probably it will get even worse from him. Hmm. Uh, Alan, um, what do you think about the entire Palestinians being ignored at this point in time, that entire issue? I mean, uh, certainly this cannot move ahead, right, without the Palestinians being involved. I mean, when do you see that happening? When do the Palestinians come into the picture um, in actually then being spoken to directly about this quote-unquote peace plan, if at all? Well, one of the things that people talk about in Israel and Palestine as if it were something holy is the status quo. And the status quo has uh, always shifted and always changed, but people continue to believe the status quo is a holy thing. So it seems that a tension can exist for a very long time without any real change happening. Uh, and at the same time, let me say that for all of the concern about the settlements and the loss of Palestinian territory, many in Israel believe that the settlement uh, uh, the settlement movement has in fact failed. 
there are more Israelis in the settlements than there used to be. There's no question about that. And they do impinge on Palestinian territory, and it is a significant problem. Don't get me wrong. At the same time, the growth rate in the Palestinian only growth is really internal. It, is a, it isn't as if thousands of Israelis have picked up from their uh, apartments in Tel Aviv and moved to the West Bank, the supposed uh, historic uh, homeland of the Israelite people. And so there is pressure from loud groups within Israel to uh, acknowledge the settlements as part of Israel without any limitations. But most Israelis are not behind that. Most Israelis for practical reasons, don't support the settlements. It, they're a drain on our finances. They're a mm. political thorn in our side. They bend things out of shape. And so other than the right-wingers and the settlers, who, as, the, as Professor Meckelberg noted correctly, are not in this government, uh, Alan, I don't if, see if I could, if I could just come in for, I apologize for cutting you off. I just wanted to push you on a point because, at least from the outside in, you can correct me if I'm wrong, of course. But the the image that we have, right, from the outside, is that a lot of Israelis do support very right wing policies because they, at the end of the day, do support Netanyahu to a very large extent, and he's the one who talks a lot about all of the above sorts of policies when it comes to settlements. Otherwise, what are your thoughts on that? Right, uh, people support Netanyahu. Uh, because he has held the country in a fairly stable position. Uh, he has fought off, in fact, the extreme right wing within Israel. He isn't really popular. People have had their fill of him, but there hasn't been anybody come along who can, who Israelis believe will protect their security and be able to deal with the world stage. Gantz is a former general, but he's still a greenhorn when it comes to politics. And it's like there isn't anybody else but Netanyahu. My daughter, who's grown up uh, for the last, doesn't remember a prime minister other than Netanyahu. And I think that kind of uh, inertia has carried him through. And again, the Netanyahu talks right wing and he tries to keep it, but at the same time, he tries to keep it down. I'm not saying he's a liberal. I'm not saying he's today going to uh, move to a two-state solution and, and empty out the settlements. Mm. But there are far more right-wing people in the government, excuse me, in the country. But they are a minority, and Netanyahu is really, uh, in fact, tries to keep them from taking over their government, such as uh, the fact that uh, Bennett and Shaked mm. uh, are not in this government. All right, so Yossi, let me, let me bring you back. If I am I correct to understand, then Yossi, that that the Middle East peace plan by Donald Trump is a dead on arrival, and b that it was just a, a charade for public viewing um, for those who are right wing within Israel, and and to possibly again appease those within the United States who would want this to go through, and that this will not really have as much of an impact on the ground as we may have thought. It, it was born, it's still born. There was no peace plan. It was not, it, it sidelined the Palestinian. Let me just make a point here. Netanyahu was not supported by the majority of Israeli voters. Those are sell-out politicians in Israel, led by Gantz and Amir Peretz and Orly Levi Abuksis, that voted actually on a ticket, just not Netanyahu, and decided to sell out. I think this is important. There were 61 against 59 that actually were voted in in, in, in the last Knesset, I mean, the last elections, on the basis that they won it Netanyahu, and then they sold out. So this is, I think it's important to see that he doesn't have a majority mm -hmm. among the voters. Now, moving on from, to your question, if you, I, I never heard about diplomacy that made with one side. This is not diplomacy. This is trying to have a diktat. And this diktat is not going uh, to work, and there is no reason for the Palestinian to accept it. Not after the, uh, the Trump administration cuts $350 million from UNRWA that looks after the Palestinian refugees and $20 million from hospital in East Jerusalem and, and, and basically tells the Palestinian that annexation in their occupied territory is an internal uh, po political, Israeli political matter. So who, who is, is going to negotiate? How can you have a lasting peace when one side is completely sidelined, ignored, and, and 
worse than that is 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 insulted. Uh, the only thing is to look for the elections in the United States on the 3rd of November this year. And if there is a change in administration, you know, we need to, as, as, as any good system needs to be rebooted from time to time and change the operational system. And boy, the United States needs a change of operational system. Hmm. Alan, the final word. Uh, let, let's then talk about the U.S. rule in all this. Do you think that uh, come November, if Biden, for example, does win, uh, hypothetically, that that would change the U.S. approach towards uh, Israel? Because, I mean, if we're talking honestly, I mean, during the Obama years, it was only really when he was just about to leave office, basically, that he became a bit tougher on Israel. Do you really think that Biden would come into office and be tough on Israel? I don't think Biden would come into office to be tough on Israel. He has been a supporter of Israel, but he also isn't a supporter of the Trump plan, uh, such as it is, and there certainly will be a change in the American approach toward Israel. Uh, the uh, Democratic administrations uh, have been uh, stronger on insisting that Israel aim for a two-state solution and have been critical of settlement growth. Uh, but as I said, in some ways, there isn't a lot of settlement growth to be critical of. Uh, programs and projects are announced all the time, and they're and they're not carried through. But Biden will have many other problems to deal with. Uh, Israel will be on the agenda, as it always is. And uh, he will s promise the same things about the unbreakable bond between Israel and uh, Israel and the United States. But it's not going to be the thing he jumps into day one. He has been around long enough to see many presidents uh, fail in this matter. On the other hand, I think he will reopen conversations with Palestinian leadership, and Palestinian leadership is such as it is, which is kind of hanging on by a thread itself, is expecting to have somebody to talk to after November. Um, they may be wrong, I don't know, uh, but I think that clearly is their, is their strategy. They're, uh, they're waiting, as they've waited many times before. They have a lot of patience even though people in the Palestinian territories on a daily basis are struggling. Many of them are struggling to live normal uh, lives. Uh, but the leadership in the Palestinian territories is certainly not going to do anything significant uh, until the U.S. elections. Very well. We'll leave it there. And we appreciate both Alan and Yossi for their time. And of course, the context that provided a very interesting discussion, viewers, because uh, seemingly what we've all understood from the outside, at least, may not be what the truth is on the ground, that um, this is just a lot of talk, a lot of hot air, essentially, just for public consumption or just to appease certain lobbies in, in either place, be it Israel or the United States, um, and that this may not actually be acted upon. Of course, in the, the coming days, will. Uh, prove that true or false. Uh, nevertheless, the Palestinians remain concerned because they're not a part of this entire process anyways. They're not part of the discussion, seemingly. Uh, everyone seems to be discussing things that will happen to them and to their land as they perceive it um, versus speaking to them directly about what they want and what they uh, what their grievances are and have been throughout all of these years of the occupation. Um, so again, an interesting discussion uh, a lot of people looking forward then to November this year to see what exactly happens in the United States vis-a-vis -vis the election. If Donald Trump does come back, does that mean Israel will act upon an annexing the West Bank? Uh, will things drastically change at that point? Or if Biden comes in, what does that actually mean on the ground? Because uh, we have to note that, is, that U.S. presidents have always supported Israel. So no one really has the political courage, certainly especially in a first term, to want to mess with that sort of thing and to tell the Israelis that, no, they can't now follow through on the Trump Middle East peace plan. I'll be back with my next segment after this break. Hello viewers, welcome back to Scope. We're now going to discuss Sri Lanka and ongoing seemingly Islamophobia within that country, especially since the Easter bombings, Easter Sunday bombings that took place there. Facebook currently has apologized for its role um, in that violence that took place vis-a-vis uh, -vis a lot of fake news that came out on that platform and, of course, other social media platforms as well. But Facebook has come out um, and apologized for that, considering an investigation was 
um, done into its role in all of that vis-a-vis -vis fake news. And it's, there are a couple of examples of the kinds of fake news that were, were perpetrated and propagated through Facebook uh, in that regard. Now, that's one issue, of course, about the role of social media in creating hatred and, and you know, encouraging hatred in places like Sri Lanka and other countries around the world, which Facebook has also spoken about, namely Indonesia and Cambodia. But then there's also then the separate issue of just Islamophobia within Sri Lanka itself. Um, and even the OIC has not come out and spoken about its concern about Islamophobia and hate speech towards Muslims in Sri Lanka. And so has the International Crisis Group. And the International Crisis Group then goes on to talk about also the arrest of a number of important Muslim politicians, as well as just critics of the government uh, at this time as well, including a lawyer and others. Let's put all of that to our expert panelists who are joining us now. We're now joined by Rohan Bastin, who is an associate professor of anthropology at Deakin University. He's recently published Historical Threads of Buddhist Muslim Relations in Sri Lanka. Joining us now this evening from Geelong in Australia. Joining us from Dunedin in New Zealand is Sanjana Hadatua, who is a senior researcher at the Center for Policy Alternatives, Sri Lanka. Uh, Sanjana and Rohan, thank you both for your time this evening. Sanjana, let, let me start with you. Um, let's firstly talk about just the role of social media, right, within uh, what happened um, post those Easter Sunday bombings. Um, what do you think the role of the likes of Facebook were in the kinds of fake news that we may have seen come out and the encouragement then towards, towards hatred towards Muslims in the country? Well, first, a clarification. I think it's important that the viewers recognize and realize that the report that Facebook released recently is not about the Easter Sunday violence or terrorism. In fact, it's coming out of the 2018 violence in March, so it's quite a while ago. Um, I think that there is a certain degree of confusion that Facebook has apologized for everything that has happened in the past couple of years, and that's not the case. The report is to a very specific time, mm. uh, and it was the first time that the company engaged with Sri Lanka in this manner, despite the fact that some of us in the country had said that the platform was being used for a number of years before for exactly the same reasons that you highlighted in the framing of the program. With that said, what we saw after the Easter Sunday bombings, before and after, even up until COVID-19, is the platform and its products, and the two are separate. Lots of people tend to think of Facebook only as the platform, but we're talking about Instagram, Messenger, and WhatsApp as well, in addition to Facebook as you and I would use it, has been used for every imaginable type of phobia, uh, racism, communalism, and inciting hate and violence. Uh, this has been sustained at a high pitch. Uh, the volume and the speed of production is sustained that is indicative of coordination and collaboration. A lot of it is in singular, if not all of it. And it specifically targets Islam and Muslims in addition to other protected minority and religious groups. And it is quite disturbing. Hmm. Um, thank you for the question, Sanjana, firstly, on what exactly Facebook's report said. Um, Rohan, uh, tell me what your thoughts are about that. Because within the country, then, we have right now as well, at least according to the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, a concerning trend. Um, and then, of course, this goes back as well to the Easter Sunday bombings, even though Facebook may not have spoken about that specifically. But ever since then, and for a number of years now, there has then been this concern about the trend uh, at this point in time vis-a-vis -vis Muslims. And we can obviously talk about others as well in the country. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I, I think Sanjana's point is well made uh, in that what Facebook was referring to was 2018. And uh, and then we see in 2019, after the uh, after the Easter bombings, um, an, a continuing trend, and that continuing trend I think is even evident in more recent events with the ways in which, for example, um, Muslims have been targeted in in association with COVID-19, and uh, looking at the papers today. For example, in Sri Lanka, there's there's some relief that uh, that there's data uh, emerging uh, of COVID-19 cases which have nothing to do with Muslims at all. It's to do with the Sri Lankan Navy. Um, but what we see is a very active uh, campaign where, and a long a long historical one, I would add, where what I would say is that what we're seeing is the new technologies of old enmities and, and um, prejudices and hatreds. Hmm. 
All right, so San Sanjana, a lot of people would say that um, a lot of what we're seeing right now playing out on the ground vis-a-vis -vis, um, Islamophobia would go back then to the current Sri Lankan leadership, uh, pol political leadership I'm talking about, of course. Um, do you see it that way as well? Do you think that Rajapaksa has encouraged this sort of thing? Uh, listen, um, the political architecture and the timber and the tone and the thrust of political leadership definitely has a resonance in social, political, communal and cultural relations on the ground. It is, however, simplistic to suggest that the current presidency and political leadership is the genesis of the problem, as the other guest also has mentioned. These are decades in the making. These social, political, communal fractures are a very long time coming. And what's happening, though, is if you... Uh, you know, if I were to answer your question specifically, is a is a, is the combination, the perfect storm, as it were, of uh, the current political leadership, which is not known for its democratic credentials, uh, and it's not known for um, uh, you know uh, ameliorating or trying to address uh, hate, hurt, and harm and violence against uh, Muslims on the ground, as well as exacerbating that the nature of social media in the manner it is being used as well. So I'm doing my doctoral research on Facebook and Twitter, looking specifically at political violence and its uh, production, promotion and projection and engagement on social media. And to put very simply in a language that you were, viewers will also understand, is that you're seeing the heightened abuse of these platforms. Not saying that the platforms themselves are solely to blame, but there is uh, the space, the, the political space as well, that gives license to producers of hate and violence to incite both and get away scot-free. So there is also a great degree of impunity that is then also the result of the political leadership. So it's not just the contemporary political leadership. These are long-seated, uh, uh, deep-rooted problems in the country, but they have been exacerbated as a consequence, like in your country and like all of South Asia, as a consequence of the promotion uh, and the adoption and the democratization of social media. All right, so Rohan, you know, um... What are the roots, though, of all this? Because you, you both have spoken about the fact that there are uh, these are long-standing issues. But at the same time, we, it can also be argued the opposite, that Muslims and, and all others within Sri Lanka have lived side by side in peace and harmony for many, many years. So um, what exactly, then, is at the root of all this? Like, who is benefiting from this, is what I wonder, by creating this sort of hatred? That's a good question. Before I answer it, I would just like to add one other thing, though, to... Uh, the issue of the use of social media, because as, uh, as Sanjana says, the, a, a great deal of it is, is in Sinhala. There's also a great deal uh, which is being communicated between countries. Uh, and so, for example, there are, there's communication between groups in Sri Lanka and groups in, in Myanmar and also groups in Thailand, uh, where you're seeing similar issues and similar mobilizations of, uh, of, 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 of a Buddhist antagonism in those places. In elsewhere, in India, I think it's more, it's, it's, it's more to do with Hindu and Muslim. Uh, as far as the, the, the deep-seated nature of the antagonisms, uh, I think it's important to, to note that in the years of the long civil war in Sri Lanka, uh, the Muslim population um, was oftentimes used as a political football um, by both sides in that conflict. Uh, and so, you, for example, there was a, a process whereby the Muslims in the north of Sri Lanka were expelled, uh, a mass uh, ethnic cleansing at one stage um, by by the Tamil separatist militants, uh, and there were also major attacks in the eastern in the eastern province, and there was a very big and serious attack in the early 90s, which was in the area from which the people responsible for the uh, for the bombings in in Easter of 2019, uh, where they came from. So there was that long, there was that tension within the ethnic conflict um, and uh, whereby the, the Muslims became oftentimes the, uh, the, the kind of court in the middle. 
but prior to that, there's also been a very long history of antagonisms, which is associated with a traditional emphasis by the Muslim population of Sri Lanka in trade. And as the Muslims were predominantly the traders, uh, oftentimes they were blamed for things like rice price, imported rice price hikes. And this would lead to certain riots that went on in the late 19th century, had an impact, for example, in the first big ethnic riots that were in the country, which in 1915, uh, which against the Muslims. And so what you're seeing is that it's oftentimes taking on this aspect of economic deprivation and then the, the scapegoating of people for this predicament of, of, um, of deprivation. And then you have the process by which governments, different governments, yeah. uh, have used that and mobilised that, okay. and different other groups, like Buddhist clergy, for example, have mobilised that antagonism, which people are feeling in their hip pockets. And I think that's coming out again in relation to COVID-19. Asanjana, I wonder what you think the, the Sri Lankan diaspora makes of all of this, right? Because, I mean, I know a lot of Sri Lankans back in Toronto as well. I, I grew up with a lot of them in high school and I went to high school with a lot of them. Um, I, I imagine that a lot of them on the outside in would be looking at um, the way that their country is being spoken of by the OIC or the International Crisis Group with a bit of horror, right? Um, and they would want their country to not be heading in this direction, at least um, for those who, those who I know for sure. And I imagine that's the case for many inside the country too. Does that put pressure that on the government to, do you think, um, reform what's happening within the country? Well, it's an interesting question. I think that the plural applies more than the singular. There are many diasporas um, in all the countries. Uh, and it isn't to say that they all agree with each other. And it isn't to say that they have a common united understanding and perception of the country from wherever they, uh, wherever they are either. Uh, so yes, there is that opinion that your friends and uh, I and you would share. Uh, and there would be others who have very different opinions as well. So I can't speak for the diaspora or the diasporas, but I think that the second part of your question is an interesting one. And you have a president who has articulated very explicitly, not unlike Mr. Modi up north in India, uh, that he came into power as a consequence of the majority vote. And the majority vote in Sri Lanka is a southern vote. And a southern vote uh, captures and is an umbrella phrase and is another way of saying that it is a Sinhala Buddhist vote. And the current president has been fairly explicit. It's not my uh, uh, understanding or opinion. It is his explicit suggestion and speech uh, that has uh, kind of said this um, repeatedly after he was elected. So you have a president who's not really ashamed um, of saying and suggesting things that are, politely put, fairly impolitic. Uh, he has also said on the 4th of February, our National Law Independence Day, that he is the president of all communities. But, you know, the aphorism that actions speak louder than words holds very true. Every single thing that he has said is counter to what the government has done. And it is also the case that the silences speak the greatest volume. Mm -hmm. um, you have injustices, you have violence, you have hate, and it's promotion and production at heightened mm -hmm. pace. Um, it seems to be getting worse uh, every week, even within COVID-19. It's quite disturbing, really. Um, and then you wonder, uh, you know, in the long term, what it means for the fabric of society and polity. And that's my concern. I'll end by saying that it's not just one man. You have Bolsonaro, or Duterte, or Trump, or Boris Johnson. Um, you have individuals who come in and are populist in nature. But what they do, and I'm sure you would recognize this in your country as well, is that populist political leadership changes the tone and timber of polity and society. Mm it shifts what is in political science called the overturn window. It gets, society gets more extremist, gets yeah. more intolerant, gets more violent. And that is what the lasting legacy a lot of us fear will okay. be of this presidency, independent of what will happen within the presidency, which is also very, very concerning. All right, so Rohan, I'll give you the final word then. What do you think the coming days will hold then for Sri Lanka vis-a-vis um, -vis relations between all these communities? Um, 
are things about to get a lot worse? I mean, you know, we've already had, as I, as I pointed out already, we've had international bodies speaking about this with concern. Does that put any pressure on the government to, to, to do anything about this? Well, I, I, I think the, the point about actions and words, I think, is well made. And uh, at the same time, I think when I, when I look at the events of 2018, and also in uh, the aftermath of the events in 2019 and the bombings, and even now in association with COVID-19, uh, there was always, a, there's a strong element within Sri Lanka uh, where you have uh, oppositional politics uh, which strives to undermine the authority of the government that's in power. And uh, I think it would be fair to say that in that the the popular vote that was given to the current president of Sri Lanka uh, derived a great deal from the Easter bombings and this desire for a strong government. Mm. Now, that strong government is in place. And in a sense, the mandate in both words and deeds uh, is to remain strong. And, uh, and I think I'm reminded of the, the old story uh, of uh, Lyndon Johnson's about the person being inside the tent rather than outside the tent uh, on this one. And I think, therefore, we will see a strong government response. Very well. We'll leave it there at that. But I sincerely appreciate both Rohan and Sanjana for their time this evening and, and for giving us, you know, an understanding, a better understanding of what's already happening on the ground there in Sri Lanka between the Muslim community there as well as the rest of Sri Lankan society. Also, um, there is at this time concern on the part of international organizations at the very least, such as the OIC, as I've mentioned to our guests, as well as the International Crisis Group, about the direction the country is heading in vis-a-vis -vis how it treats its Muslim citizens. And then we've had, of course, Facebook come out and speak about violence specifically back in 2018. This was before, as Sanjana correctly pointed out, of course, and clarified before the Easter Sunday bombings of 2019. Nevertheless, the Easter Sunday bombings just exacerbated that anti-Muslim sentiment and those, those trends only quickened, seemingly, in that regard. And fake news just uh, erupted online on Facebook. And Facebook has now admitted that that did take place and it's going to try and fix that situation going forward. But has the damage already been done to this long-standing issues, as both of our guests also mentioned? Nevertheless, as I, as I had also put to Ron, a lot of these communities have lived side by side in peace and harmony. So somebody is benefiting off the kind of hatred that is being bred between these communities at this time. And of course, this is a country that does not you know, um, a, a, a stranger to kinds of civil war or hatred between communities. There was that long, la long lasting civil war, as both of them mentioned as well, which has now ended. Uh, so there's a lot, of course, to understand when it comes to Sri Lanka, a lot of complex, you know, complexities within the country that uh, create the context that one needs to understand where this may be heading. But nevertheless, there is a lot of concern on the part of the international community, as well as Sri Lankans themselves about what may be happening between different communities in that country. I'll leave it there for now. I've been Wahar Rizvi. Thanks for watching.